So we're going to uh, begin um, sort of chronologically and, and discuss uh, Ricky's early days and how uh, some of his sort of childhood and teen and, and college years sowed the seeds for uh, the artistic developments to, for which you become very well known uh, later in life. Um, so Ricky, born in, in 1907 in South Bend, Indiana, and then uh, moves to uh, Glasgow and uh, where the, some of the, the formative experiences begin. You want to touch on that part of his life a little bit? Yeah, right? so um, my grandfather was an engineer and worked at Singer in South Bend, and uh, he was transferred to uh, uh, Glasgow to be assistant manager of the Singer company in Europe in 1913. So my dad at six, um, with his four sisters, moves with the family to, to Glasgow and, and you know has his whole for formative education in, in Scotland at, at boarding school and, and then gets a, you know, the idea of getting an uh, uh, art degree in, in, you know, 1925 or 26 when he started. That was not something that really fit into the, the family uh, thinking. And, and already my father, who's my grandfather, Walter, uh, expected my dad to go to MIT to become an engineer. And he was, you know, Good with his hands and worked in the factory, and um, but he decided to in, in high school had a formative uh, teacher who really directed him and and his interest towards um, the humanities, and and he and his sisters were always very gifted artistically and won prizes, um, and he continued to to uh, uh, paint and draw in in college and and. Uh, sort of two thirds of his way through uh, Oxford, he, he discovered the Ruskin School of Drawing in, in uh, Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, which was one big room uh, uh, in this museum, classic uh, museum, and, and uh, started going there, taking drawing. And, and when he was done with his history degree, um, his teachers there said, you know, if you really want to learn about modern art, you need to go to Paris. So in 1929, uh, he went, went to, to Paris, taught English as a way to support himself, and lived in Paris for a year, um, and studied with uh, André Lode, who's a famous uh, teacher and Cubist uh, artist, Fernand Léger, and, and uh, the artist Ozofon. And um, then uh, from a, uh, one of his teachers at Oxford, he was informed that the uh, Groton School, which is a boarding school for at that time, boys, men, um, was looking for a history teacher. And uh, so my dad went and um, interviewed in Paris with, with uh, Reverend Peabody, the, the rector, director of the school, and got this job. So in 1930, after having been in Europe for, well, from 1913, uh, uh, so 17, 17 years? Uh, 17 years, he goes back to America, having really has an English accent and as this uh, European education, traveled a lot in Europe, and, um, and, and begins teaching at Groton and cont continues to paint portraits, um, landscapes, and, and he was a painter for 20 years. Um, many people don't know that. Uh, he came to sculpture uh, really at mid-career, in a way, after the Second World War. Uh, and so he he's, uh, goes to Groton, is there for three years, and then leaves, goes and lives back in Paris with his then new wife for uh, a year. And when he comes back, the, that relationship isn't very sound. And, and he takes on uh, uh, visiting artists at, at different colleges in the Midwest through the Carnegie Corporation, which was helping colleges to seed the idea of having visual art in the curriculum in, in college. Uh, uh, colleges, and so he was a visiting artist all through the 30s uh, and into the 40s uh, at, at different colleges in the Midwest. At the same time, he was a mural painter. Went to, uh, with a, a couple friends, he went and traveled in Mexico to see Sequeras and, and Rivera and the, the big mur murals they were doing, and he um, was a, a muralist. He got, did a, 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 a painting in the Sealands Grove, Pennsylvania uh, post office naturalistic. Uh, uh, so he was very much uh, an artist of his time in that place, you know, representational, 
um, not an abstract. He, did, he was influenced by Cubism in the way he paints and thinks about light and form, but he was not a, an, um, quote, modern artist. And it was very much steeped in the Renaissance and, and how that manifested itself uh, in, 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 in the mid, you know, early 20th century. So, but he, was, he had a studio in New York starting in 1934 on Union Square, um, all the way through when he was uh, inducted into the uh, army in 1942. So he would, when he wasn't uh, in school, sort of uh, on the uh, uh, academic calendar in, in, in the Midwest and in, in Illinois and Michigan and, and other places uh, there, he'd come back to New York and work in his studio and do portraits and other paintings and uh, commissions uh, work. Um, so he had, uh, he was very much in the, uh, the sort of art world of the 1930s in, in New York. And uh, Philip Evergood was a close friend. He, uh, Kuniyoshi had a studio in the same building that he did. And uh, uh, Philip Evergood was his uh, best man and my namesake. So we, you know, he had this connection to um, figurative, the figurative tradition, narrative painting and so on. But he also saw modern art and, and was very curious and interested in uh, those things and, and uh, uh, saw Calder's show in, I think, 1936 here uh, in New York. And um, when he was in the Army, inducted in 1942, first in uh, uh, the Army Air Corps teaching first lieutenants how to use gunnery sites, uh, um, he started fiddling in the shop. As, at the same time, he was still painting portraits with a lot of portraits of his um, military colleagues. Uh, uh, um, and that was the first foray into sculpture, really. So, and, yeah, yeah, so he, he had... He had uh, a, an extensive engineering background, was also an acetate. And, I mean, it's, well, it was clear that he had, he, he had the, the bones uh, oh. for sculpture. It could have been a, a bit of inevitability because of the engineering background, but he had to, you know, kind of find it organically. Right, he, he didn't, had never studied engineering, but he had an intuitive yeah. sense of engineering. And he and his... his uh, you know, this work that you're seeing, all of the way it moves is based on a compound pendulum. So if you think of the clock that you have, if you have a, an old fashioned uh, uh, clock in the hallway, it has a pendulum that, that keeps the, uh, the, you know, that's regulated with, with weights so that it keeps moving. And that's what makes the clock work. So uh, that's a simple grandfather pendulum. being a clockmaker, that was a, I mean, that was sort of a, another seed that was sown right, very early the, on, or per, you know, created this sort of preternatural, you know, engineering um, acumen. Engineering, collect, uh, so the, the, his grandfather was a clockmaker, and he stayed with his grandfather before going to Europe that winter by himself with his namesake, George, and would go up in the clock tower every week and wind the city clock. And uh, you know, tried to take, took a, a clock apart and couldn't put it back together. So, this <laughs> kind of experience was were, were very seminal. And and um, then uh, also as a kid living in Scotland, his father bought a, a, a small yacht, and the family would go sailing every summer for a couple of weeks. And uh, all of, so the 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 gimbal, uh, the the mechanisms that you see here, the knife edge bearing, both comes from. The, the, uh, a pendulum, what a pendulum sits on, and it has very little friction. It's just a point on a surface of metal, one, one piece of metal sort of uh, pivoting on another. And the gimbal, which uh, uh, um, uh, these, some of these pieces have, allowed, that's what a compass sits on on a, on a boat. A compass has to always remain level. So the, the, the gimbal here is used, the base of the sculpture, in a sense, if you think of that as the boat, what would be the boat. Um, uh, here, the, the boat is fixed, and the gimbal allows the elements of the sculpture to move in a circle. And this piece that moves up and down, that's a simple uh, 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 knife edge bearing, and it just moves back and forth. But, but this moves, this is on a gimbal, and it moves in a circle. And it's just because uh, there are two pivot points at right angles to each other. And so uh, uh, you transferring this very simple technology, very old technology, from uh, uh, practical use in a, in a boat to sculpture, he allow, allows himself and allows his imagery to move in a new way. Um, uh, so he starts with the, those kind of things. And all of the works in here are on knife edge bearings. 
and uh, they're very sensitive because it's one point of metal against another, and so they are sensitive to the lightest amount of air. But then when he started making things for outdoors, the weather gets in the way and things would fall out of their yoke and they'd get damaged. And so we'll get, we'll over, get there shortly. <laughs> we'll see <laughs> things like that upstairs, but, mm -hmm. but it was his, his uh, technology is an evolution, but from the get go, from the time that he sort of looked at Calder and started playing with Calder's ideas of the cantonary and the yeah, yeah. Uh, moving. Yeah, Calder's almost, an interesting element there. I mean, he uh, certainly had a, a degree of reverence and appreciation for Calder, but he also saw in Calder some limitations. Right. So, so what, what, yeah, did he, so what did he like and, and what did he think could be expanded upon Calder-wise? He, uh, he obviously started with, with uh, uh, these similar mobiles to Calder. And this is like 1950, so he's out of the, he's out of the army, there's yep. been 20 years of painting, and then the early sculptures, he, he finds the kinetic nature in sculpture around 1950. Yeah. Right. So, and also influenced by uh, uh, Nam Gabo, made a kinetic work that was just a rod that moved back and forth. And, and so these ideas of movement were sort of in the air. And, and uh, no Calder intended. starts there with, with the mobiles that I think Duchamp said that looks like a mobile and sort of gave it a title. But um, my father explored those same kind of ideas. Uh, which uh, you know you start from the bottom and build up and, and then things balance out but then realize that Calder's cantonary can has a very limited range of movement it sort of moves back and forth all those different elements but he realized that you know I want to make my artistic voice my artistic language about movement alone you know thinking about okay in dance that's what the 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 the, the art is about the movement and he wanted to make a kind of sculpture, a kind of object making where movement is the centerpiece. So even though all the elements are, are, are simple, uh, the, the, what he is interested in is the movement and how different things relate to each other. Um, and uh, in that, he started in the, in the 50s. So he starts making sculpture like Calder in 1949. But, then in the early 50s starts making machines that, that sort of move like clocks or, you know, they're bigger, but, but they, have, they have a sense of, of uh, uh, movement uh, and uh, elements move around one another and move out of their sort of central uh, uh, place, uh, 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 configuration. And at and this it, stage they're all painted as well. He still has a, a foot in painting the first sort of decade of kinetic sculpture, 1950 to 1960, call it, the, the works were still painted. So that was still a, a a concern. Many, many painted and then using different colors of metal, brass, copper, stainless steel comes in uh, uh, and different kinds of uh, 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 joinery and so on. But he also starts exploring and getting inspiration from nature and trying to make analogous uh, or, or uh, analogies in his movement vocabulary. This is called crucifera, crucifera pillar of light. And he started, and it's got rotors, and it's also this big, uh, so all of the rotors above and below the uh, 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 pivot point balance each other out. And so um, he's, he did this uh, kind of image horizontally. He made lots of different uh, sculptures that w were referred to an aster or a bouquet or sedges, which were early lines, which were much more sinuous and more uh, 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 organic in form. And so that was through the 50s and early 60s. And then in the early 60s, he starts to think, well, I, if I want to work with movement, I want to start, I want to create work with the simplest kind of element. So the first uh, 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 series of works that he did were lines. And he did lines in all kinds of different configurations. and. Um, this is a, a later line, and this is a later, in a sense, flower or, or, or nature-inspired sculpture with all the rotors. And once he left Calder and his early um, forays into uh, 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 machines and, and other kinds of moving sculpture... And for anybody that's curious about these early works, this first decade of, of painted kinetic sculptures, we did a, a, a presentation for Art Basel online. We have a, a viewing room that is, is still active with a, 
nine remarkable early works, and you can see the, the painted nature of those. So that's that's online forever. And if you, uh, there's a whole stack of books at the back of the gallery, which you know, if you look in some of the, you'll see a lot of these early works. So you can get a, a broader, clearer sense of what I'm talking about. But but this is a good example of what I was going to say is that once he left the the very early works um, and came to his sort of mature voice and exploration, he kept coming back to you know, flower related, things that are organic, uh, uh, that, that have, uh, uh, he often like to say, I, I, some of the work has so many elements you can't count them. Um, and a nuage, you know, the, a cloud, he did, and they'll, you'll see in, in a couple of the books, images called nuage, which is the French word for clouds. And they have lots of elements, and we have a piece like that that hangs above the dining room table at the estate the, where I grew up. And if you have candles on the table, the heat of the candles makes the sculpture move. So the, the sculptures are very sensitive. And, and so, but- It's, it's so, important to remember that, so this is like early 1960s when he's you know, finding his mature voice and, and he starts creating the work that we all you know, associate when we think of George Rickey. Um, but you know, born in 1907, this is the early 60s. He's 53, <laughs> 54, 55 years old before you know, he really hits his distinct style. Yeah, late, late, uh, late maturation. Sure, sure. Um, and he always said that, uh, you know, visual artists often take a long time to find their voice. I mean, uh, uh, you know, and, and luckily he lived a long time. He was 95 when he died and, and, and uh, actually... Right up until, you know, the last year of his life. Well, really. yeah, yeah, about two weeks before he died, uh, two months before he died, he was made his last drawing. So, um, uh, uh, so... He kept, Sorry, we skipped to the end there. We'll back it up to the early 60s. He again. kept uh, working with these you know, images uh, and ideas that he had started earlier, and periodically uh, he'd, he'd come back to these very complicated pieces and then juxtaposed to the simpler piece, like the behind you, the two, L, uh, the two uh, sort of uh, L's there. Uh, that's called Modrian meets Malevich, but it's a, it's a classic. I'd say there's a dichotomy between his classical work, which are simple elements and in, at the first view look like they're minimalist, but then if a breeze comes up, then the whole relationship, the whole idea of the work changes and you, it's all about a relationship of parts, but also the relationship of the work to the environment. And that's very important in his work, especially when we get outside and, and, and look at that. But, um, yeah, he continued to do uh, and explore uh, uh, different kinds of work uh, and different kinds of movement that, uh, and always different ways of approaching uh, how the bearing was angled, which gives you a different movement, which if, if you go up to Park Avenue, you'll, you'll see uh, uh, sculptures where the movement of the forms are through a cone, which is very different from what we're used to. A wheel moves in one plane, and you know we move in our legs more or less move in one plane unless we're doing dance and so on, um, and that uh, offers new creative and new expressive opportunity. Uh, and he works with solid forms and also open frame forms, which uh, changes uh, what you can do and 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 how the work uh, is in, engaging with its environment. Yeah. And so in in '64 um, he participates in, in Documenta. Um, and that is a, a watershed moment in terms of monumentality. Um, so we, we make create the, the two lines work, which is now in, in MoMA's collection. Um, and that, that was really, again, another watershed moment in terms of scale, let me say. So yeah, uh, 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 Eric's referring to a, a piece of the same scale. If you, we, when we go up on the roof, you'll see a, a, a sculpture with 30 foot uh, lines, red lines. So. In, yeah, in Documenta, he had a, a, a stainless steel sculpture in, with 32-foot lines, and that made a big impact. It was bigger than any other sculpture in the, in the place, and it moved, and it moved on knife-edge bearings, like some of these pieces here. And that was uh, uh, purchased by Alfred Barr at the Museum of Modern Art, and that was the, really the beginning of his um, uh, 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 strong career where he could give up teaching, which he'd done for, you know, 30, since 1930, uh, and, and focus solely on making sculpture. And from that period on, from 64, mid-60s, 
he ever got more busy with lots of different kinds of commissions um, in public spaces and museums and, and, and corporate um, uh, uh, commissions in the US, in Japan, in Germany, Switzerland. So, um, and in 19, he had shows in Germany in the early 60s and, and, uh, and also in Holland. And the Dutch and the Germans and the Swiss were very sympathetic to his aesthetic and to his sense of movement. So he spent a lot of time in, in Germany uh, from uh, 1968 through the mid 90s, had a house or a studio in Berlin and would go there every winter for about four months. And then later went out to Santa Barbara. You know, East Chatham is cold in the winter, we all know about that. And as he got older, there was a place he could work on small scale, similar scale to here, but he had a shop in uh, upstate New York where the estate is where all the big monumental sculptures were fabricated and he had a team of people who, who worked for him. Yeah. And what, uh, so the, you're saying the knife edge bearings of uh, the, the work that was in, in Documenta, um, obviously the, as you can see in the works in this room, highly sensitive um, and not quite as resilient to, to weather at that time. So that would eventually require another innovation of ball bearings. Right, so, so he, uh, he's becoming one of the most sought after ubiquitous public sculptors in the world, um, but still had some, some problems to solve um, when it came to you know, the resiliency of, of the works. So as I was saying, the, as his technology changed, different kinds of bearing, even within the knife edge bearing, he innovated there too, which allowed different kinds of forms to be made and to move more freely and allowed him to have a broader uh, uh, to have a broader spectrum of ways of putting these simple elements together to create sculpture. Uh, so, yeah, as, as Eric said, the early uh, outdoor pieces all were on these same kind of knife edge bearing, which as you can imagine, are susceptible to weather. And so after a certain point, he realized, you know, if I'm gonna work in the public realm outdoors, I need to uh, uh, make work that's gonna be resilient enough to hold up to the weather. So. Um, the three pieces we'll see upstairs, he, they move on the ball bearings, but they don't, the elements uh, don't move all the way around. So he had to figure out a way to limit the path of the movement so that when it got to the end of its uh, 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 path, that it would stop and then move back again. Otherwise, those elements would, as before, you know, contact the ground and then get bent. And, and so he started working with uh, different kinds of shock absorbers. And then finally, what are on the pieces upstairs are shock absorbers of his own design. So, but the, the purpose of that is to uh, keep the, 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 the to, to limit the, the path of the, of the uh, and, and it also, um, and the, those pieces in normal wind go to the end of their path and then move back the other way, just the way they do in, in this, in the room here. Um, but, but uh, uh, and they would do that even without the, the shock absorber, but the shock absorber is what protects the work from, you know, <laughs> being a Jean Tingley that's continually destroying itself. Yeah. And while, <laughs> while these unprecedented sculptural innovations are, are being made, uh, how much consultation did he have with engineers or people that were you know, expert within that realm? So, or was it, um, or was it yeah, strictly he, guess and test? At the beginning he was doing, he had a, a strong intuitive understanding of engineering. His grandfather, the clockmaker, his, his uh, father, a mechanical engineer, and just an innate understanding and, and, uh, of wind and, 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 and technology. Um, but yeah, as he starts to make bigger work and uh, commissions, um, uh, requirements change and he needed to have engineering certification that the work was designed to a certain wind speed. So he, when he, he taught uh, his last teaching uh, uh, position was at the RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy. He taught young engineers and architects uh, uh, his sort of um, uh, 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 first year three-dimensional design. And uh, one of his colleagues taught the engineering program in the, in the, in the uh, uh, architecture school. So Roland Hummel uh, began, a, you know, in a way, a second career or, or a parallel career to his own teaching, one of being my father's engineer from about 1966 till he uh, finished working for us, the estate, myself, 
uh, in about 2009. So he had this, you know, whatever that is, of, of, of 40, 43 year career. And he, all of his, uh, my dad's big works, Roland did, did the engineering for that. So there's a certain kind of partnership. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a sculptor and, I, you know, there's always team people that you have to work with to make work that comes into the public realm, either because it's so big and that you need to have. Uh, so he, he developed a very uh, close relationship with this engineer who, at, after he retired from teaching, had an office at the estate and worked really every day there. Because uh, my dad in the 80s became ever more busy. In the 80s and 90s, he was extremely busy showing and with commissions. Um, you know, all over the world, uh, at very large, you know, up to 50 feet high a sculpture, all that moves. And all, all of those works also hold up very well. So they, they don't require um, uh, much maintenance except greasing the bearings, yeah. which is important. And in terms of his, his process, um, you know, when he's exploring a new visual language or a new engineering component, um, were there extensive uh, written studies, drawings, processes, or is it is it all kind of intuitive and, and, and with his hands? Well, a lot of a lot of it, especially early, was intuitive, but but with lots of trial and error. You're you're starting to to develop a, a new language, and and you know he starts with Calder and then uh, uh, pivots. You know these are very uh, very simple. A yoke that holds the 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 uh, um, uh, uh, rotor similar to what's in a clock or in, a, in your watch that makes things move. And he, his, some of his early pieces used clock uh, uh, gears as, as the rotors <laughs> from, the, from the Rome uh, uh, flea market. Um, but really these innovations were birthed out of hours and hours and hours in, in the studio. Well, lots of trial and error. Yeah. So uh, um, uh, if you go up to Park Avenue, the, the, the breaking column is a, a sculpture composed of three three components, three elements that are each attached to the one below it. And uh, uh, that's a difficult concept to make because everything in the lowest moving element has to balance everything above it. So uh, there are a lot of things that needed to be worked out there where it's, it's elbows, joints, things you don't want them to bump into each other. So there are many, many studies for that sculpture and also related pieces um, uh, that were taped together. And so I, an idea might be sketched out and then he would go into the studio almost immediately and start making something small to sort of get an idea of, oh, this is possible. This is, I need to think about these problems. And then, you know, it would be built at a successively larger scale if he had a commission and was doing, you know, a 25 foot or 30 foot high sculpture of that idea. It, it was worked up in different scales before the final piece was both designed and engineered for a specific site. Mm -hmm. Yep, makes sense. Um, so uh, obviously the, the blades came first. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the other components of the visual language, whether it be cubes or the circular forms and um, you know what, uh, how these sort of exciting developments proceeded yeah, in so, the 70s, um, 80s, 90s? In the 60s, he started, as I said, with lines and all kinds of configurations. And uh, the, 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 what he was interested in was the relationship of the moving elements and the technology, how they move was secondary. That's a way of getting at the, the language and, and, the, and, the, and the work and what the work is doing. Um, but he started with uh, lines and then uh, closed planar squares and rectangles were all in the later part of the 60s. Uh, uh, so after he made his first plane sculpture in like 1965, is a square, simple, small piece, just to see what what is what is what is a, a single flat surface with the same kind of uh, polished or ground surface that catches the light. So the light uh, and the reflectivity and the play of light across different elements is what took over from the color. Um, so color was important. Uh, at the beginning because he was a painter and he wanted things to have visibility. Um, and then once he started working with stainless steel and came to this all over uh, surface uh, uh, that, that is, um, it catches the light in, 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 in non-regular ways. And that, that, that randomness of the surface was very important. Um, and it's, it's a specific grid, a 60 grid uh, 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 disc 
and he takes the whole sheet before it's cut up and the whole thing gets ground in, in this random way uh, at a low angle. So it, it, but, but you can see uh, the same element the, because the, the uh, grinding is, is random across the surface, it doesn't catch the light in, a, in the same way. Even like this, this uh, the cubes there is a much later idea. That's from the 90s. He came to cubes is a you know, difficult uh, thing to make a, a big uh, cubic structure that's light enough uh, 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 to, to move easily. So, so, um, uh, uh, the, the, so he worked with the planes, squares, triangles, uh, 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 rectangles at all different sizes and configurations. There's a hexagon piece that hangs on a wall or rectangles at an angle on a wall. So it's like a, a minimalist painting, but it, it's not minimal because <laughs> they move and then they each panel catches light and they move in different ways. Um, so, and then in the early uh, 70s, he, he uh, started uh, after having been to Japan in 1969 uh, to do a big project for Expo 70. Um, he, he was interested in, in Japanese prints uh, he, he is interested in when you see a, a, like a window open or a door open, you, you're looking from the, the, the inside or the outside into another space. That idea of the frame, framing an, an image that's different from where you are. And so the, the first frame or open, what he called open rectangles or open uh, uh, squares and triangles, he worked with all those uh, forms as an open form as well as closed form, but he was interested in how it framed what you were seeing through uh, through those uh, let's say two two rectangles that are moving back and forth. Uh, that changes how you view uh, the the other side of the room or or the landscape that you're seeing through it. That the and as um, he was working outside. Uh, and we live, he lived in, in the upstate New York, so, so the landscape um, was important and, and all of the big work was tested in the, in the you know, rural upstate New York uh, near, near Albany. So the, uh, as he worked more uh, outdoors, the, the landscape starts to become a, a, a something that he really is conversing with. And um, you know, his movement is being caused by the weather and the air, and it's in a way talking to uh, the natural surrounding. Um, and uh, 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 to the point where we, we had, uh, he created, and there were some ponds on the property already, but he was interested in, in putting work on the pond. And the, that opened up a whole new set of opportunities because when you put something on the pond, as we all know, the, the water reflects. So he had these moving elements that are m either moving horizontally to the water or in other configurations. And then you have this other image that is the reflection. So the, this, this uh, interplay between nature and, and sculpture and, and how you uh, uh, see one through the other and, and reflect differently on nature after having seen uh, the artwork or the artwork in nature. Um, you know, and I would say, he always often said that uh, 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 nature imitates art, which is, you know, first something that we don't think is true, but I think what he was, uh, what he thought and meant by that is that when we've seen an artwork, a, a painting of Constable, of clouds, when we next time see clouds, we're reminded and sort of that Constable painting comes back, ah, I'm seeing the clouds in this sort of something I've seen before that's captured that, and I see the clouds that I'm seeing right now in this storm in a different way because of that experience of art. And I would say that my father, though you think his, his work and his elements are austere and sort of me mechanized or mechanical, that's an overt view. Once you see them moving in, the, in relation to the, the quaking aspen upstairs or the, the, it's a very different conversation than just making a, an image that's by itself and, and totally self-contained. His work is the, the relationships are, are fixed, but the, the, the expression of that form, that sculpture is always random and different. It's never captured in one moment. And that uh, interplay of control and randomness 
and that uh, uh, he's allowing something outside of his control to be controlling the way you see the work. And that's a, a very important part of, of, of his work, whether it's indoors or, or not. And then the circles are a very late uh, image. And uh, making a circle out of sheet metal is, is difficult. <laughs> sheet metal is flat and you, you have to. So those took a, 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 you know, a decade to figure out how to make. And he made them at all different scales. And the first ones were you know, uh, 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 sort of uh, small on the wall. And they, they, a lot of them look very ugly. I guess it's an ugly process, uh, 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 trial and error. Um, but the most, uh, the biggest circle that he did, the, the, you'll see one on Park Avenue, a single circle. So you see the, 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 that moving against the, the trees of the malls and also the architecture. And then if, if you go to the corner of 48th Street and 6th Avenue, his, I would say his, one of his last masterpieces of annular eclipse, 16 feet, is on the plaza in front of the News Corp building. And that's a 35-foot you know, high sculpture with 16-foot circles. And they, they move very slowly. So he's interested not in sort of the circles per se, but he's in, the circles create the, the aperture, the, the crescent between the two circles, the way they move across one another was what he was excited about. And it, that idea came to him having seen the uh, 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 numbra and, and the penumbra of an of a annular eclipse on leaves in autumn uh, at, at, on the driveway at, 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 the, at the house in East Chatham. So out of that, again, natural uh, 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 inspiration comes this very big series of, of circular pieces that you know, at, at first glance, it's just two circles. But, but when you stop and wait and look, not only at that, but all of his work requires patience and time. And that was important. He wanted you people to stop and wait and take the time to look and see what the response is going to be. What is that path going to do? And uh, so it's about slowing down and, and, and sort of even in the jumble of Park Avenue, the work's sort of give you a different kind of sense of a piece, even in the middle of this, our Boulevard, America's Boulevard uh, and Park Avenue. You've set a, a very nice stage, Philip. Um, so uh, with that, I we invite everybody here to follow us up to the roof. We can see uh, the three monumental works uh, that will be installed through the spring on the Kasman Rooftop Sculpture Garden. Um, certainly make a point to get to Park Avenue and, and slow down for a moment or two and, and take in the nine wonderful monumental sculptures between 52nd and 56th Street. Um, and I'll also mention that the definitive biography on George Rickey will be released on September 30th. Um, we're actually doing a, a book reading here and a, a launch with Belinda Rathbone, the author. Um, so uh, look for that on Amazon also. Uh, and thank you very much for coming today. Thank you.